Hi, my name is Barry and welcome to our class on Psalm 119. And thank you to Jord and Rach for inviting me to talk on this incredible subject. Pray that uh, you will find this class interesting and that it will stimulate you into looking deeper into the Psalm of all Psalms. To the end that it will bring you closer to our Father through our Lord and our Saviour, even Jesus Christ. Especially when it comes to our praise and worship. The reason why I call this the Psalm of All Psalms is because of the 150 Psalms recorded for us, it is the longest Psalm. Of the seven acrostic Psalms, it's the only Psalm that is based on a repetition of eight. And this is very important because eight, as you know, is the number of resurrection. It was on the eighth day that a baby boy was circumcised, which was symbolic of a cutting off of mortality. And we will remember that Jesus was raised from the dead on the eighth day which was the first day of a new week, the first day of a new life, even immortal life. It is probably the psalm that Jesus sang as he arose from the dead in the cold tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And it is probably the psalm that we will sing with a hundred million other voices as we enter into the promised land under Joshua, a greater than Joshua, even Jesus. When we look at uh, Psalm 119, we need to look at it in the context of the book of Psalms. Of the 150 Psalms, it falls into the last section. We'll recall that there are five sections in the book of Psalms. Each of these sections uh, is associated with uh, one of the books of the laws of Moses. So the first book being Genesis is associated with Psalm 1 through 41. Exodus, Psalms 42 through 72. The book of Leviticus from Psalm 73 through 89, Numbers through Psalms 90 to 106, and, and finally Deuteronomy, uh, Psalm 107 to 150. Why is this important? Well, it is important that this psalm fits into uh, the Deuteronomy section of the book of Psalms. Deuteronomy, as we all know, is the second giving of the law. You'll remember that Moses gave the law the second time uh, to the generation that was about to enter into the promised land under Joshua. Their parents and their grandparents had died because over the last 38 years, uh, their carcasses had fallen in the wilderness because they refused to enter into the land. You remember Joshua and Caleb came back and said, well, we've got a big God, the giants are small. And the other 10 spies had said, Mm -mm, no, we can't enter into the land because we have a small God and the giants are too big. And so it was this new generation that was now about to enter into the promised land. And so Psalm uh, 119 fits comfortably into this space as the children of Israel prepare themselves to enter into uh, the promised land. So the book of Psalms is central to Old Testament praise and worship. Music played a large part in the life and worship of the children of Israel. The songs of Zion and Israel's singers were famous throughout the world. You'll remember in Psalm 137 and at verse 3 we read, Of those who carried us away captive, they asked us a song, and those who plundered us requested a mirth, saying, Sing unto us the songs of Zion. And we said, How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And again in 1 Chronicles 23 and at verse 5, we find that David created a choir of 4,000 that praised Jehovah with musical instruments which he had made for giving praise. And in Amos 6 and at verse 5, we find that those who sang to the sound of stringed instruments and invented for themselves musical instruments like David. Now all the psalms were sung, most of them were accompanied by an instrument. Most of these instruments are found in the book of Psalms and they fall into three groups, stringed instruments, wind instruments and percussion. A number of these instruments are recorded for us in the grand finale of all psalms, Psalm 150. Reading Psalm 150 and from verse 3, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. 
Praise Him with a clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Now we know that David was a man after God's own heart. He wrote at least half of the Psalms. Some would suggest 72, others 75, but let's not uh, worry too much about that for the time being. At least half of the Psalms uh, written by David. Uh, and David is a man after God's own heart. Is it any wonder then that the Psalms were the hymnal of the Old Testament? Uh, the very place where uh, our hearts and the heart of God can be knit together through music. Is it any wonder that when God Almighty laid the foundations of the earth, that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? When we come to the New Testament, we find these words in the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. Music is cross-cultural. It appeals to every nation, kindred, and tongue. And the book of Psalms contains the contents or the words. It does not contain the genre. And I think for a very important reason, because in the end of the day, content is important. The, the genre, the music, uh, at the end of time, will be brought together by the greatest choir master that ever lived, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Music is also central to our praise and worship. Music communicates with the human soul in a way that can only be described as divine. Music can calm the mind, and yet it can arouse deep emotions and passions. Music can take the human soul to places that it has never been before. It can take us into the highest heaven in praise and worship, and yet it can take us to the lowest parts of the earth with jarring noises and monotonous drum beats. And music can take us to anywhere in between. So while Psalm 119 has no heading, and it does not bear the writer's name, it doesn't have any musical instruments associated with it, I believe that it is the greatest psalm of all times, the greatest song ever written. It is the psalm of all psalms. It is the song of resurrection, and possibly the song of Moses and of the Lamb, which we find in the book of Revelation. With 176 verses, it is the longest psalm as well as the longest chapter in the Bible. It is an acrostic psalm in which each set of eight verses begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet in sequence. The theme of the psalm is focused on the man who delights and loves to live by the Torah, by the sacred law. This psalm is about Jesus. It is his song. Jesus was the only one that fulfilled the Torah. I come not to destroy the law, but to fill it fuller, he tells us in Matthew's Gospel. He's the only one that fulfilled the Torah in all its beauty, in its simplicity. Jesus was the only one who was undefiled in the way, who walked in the law of Jehovah, who kept Jehovah's testimonies, who sought Jehovah with his whole heart. Jesus was the only one who did no iniquity and walked in God's ways. So as we come to Psalm 119 and reading the first eight verses, coming under the first letter, Aleph. Aleph basically is designed from the ox's head. Originally, it was written like this. So you can see uh, the, the concept of, of the ox's head with the horns at the top and the ears underneath. And uh, in cursive Hebrew today, we write the Aleph like that. And of course, we have inherited that, which has no meaning whatsoever. But the Aleph is designed around the ox's head, and the ox is a symbol of service. It's a symbol that aligns itself with the eunuchs of Israel, those that are eunuchs for the kingdom of God. And so we come to verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of Jehovah. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. 
I mean, these words can only be written of Jesus, the one who keeps his testimonies, that walks in his ways, that keeps his commandments, that keeps his precepts diligently. This is the psalm of Jesus. This is a psalm about those who are not forced to keep God's law, but who love God's law, who love doing his testimonies, his ways, his precepts, his commands, his statutes. This is the psalm of all psalms. Now, one of the interesting things about the psalm is that there are 10 key words which line up basically with the 10 commandments or the Torah as it was given to Moses in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. The word derech means way, uh, idut means testimony, apikadum means precepts, mitzvah means commandment, imra means saying, Torah means law, mishpat means judgment, tzadek, tzadok means righteousness, Huka means statutes, dabar means word. So those are the 10 key words in Psalm 119 and they occur in every single verse throughout the psalm other than uh, verse 122. So I mentioned earlier that uh, eight is a very important number in terms of uh, understanding uh, resurrection. So coming back to the eighth day and uh, Genesis 17 and at verse 10. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old shall be circumcised, every male child of your generations. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So when we come to the lessons of circumcision, we realize that eight is a, a vital number. It, um, it speaks of the cutting off of mortal flesh. It, it speaks of the cutting off of mortality. It speaks of the, the cutting off of mortal desire. And so that is why we find in the New Testament, Jesus is raised on the eighth day of the old week, but it is the first day of a new week, the first day of a new creation, the first day of resurrection, new life, immortality. So let's try and explain this by way of using this diagram. If we look at this uh, spiral over here, we can see a day one, over here, then day two, day three, day four, day five, six, and seven. And when we come to day eight, we see here that day eight is lining up with day one. So we get this beautiful spiral. Because you know, normally what would happen in um, the way Gentiles measure time, uh, we either measure time, uh, if we're illustrating time, by way of a line, a single line. And the Greeks would often uh, portray time or eternity. Um, with a circle but uh, as far as Jewish thinking is concerned it's always a spiral and so we can see here that uh, circumcision on the eighth day uh, the cycle of seven is a mortal cycle and that's based on the seven days of creation seven days of creation um, is a mortal cycle uh, we'll see here that there are 28 days in the menstrual cycle for example we've got uh, 70 years over here to the human cycle for, for the lifespan uh, that we have. And uh, we'll know that the gestation period of a human embryo is uh, exactly 40 weeks, which is 40 times seven. And that all points forward uh, for us to the seventh millennium, which is the, the kingdom of God, God's rest on the seventh day, pointing forward to uh, God's kingdom. But when we come to the cycle of eight, which is the immortal cycle, this is talking about the cutting off of mortal flesh. It's a shadow of uh, the resurrection. It's a shadow of the eighth millennium, which is the all in all, which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. Then just expanding these thoughts on uh, the way God uh, looks at time or has uh, designed time for us to look at, we see here the Fibonacci um, sequence of numbers. And uh, we can see how this works. It starts down at the bottom here. And you can see the spiral as it goes through. You'll notice that 8 is quite central to uh, the Fibonacci code. And we can see the spiral 
uh, coming out like this. Uh, if people uh, study art or painting, this is known as the golden means proportion. And we can see this, uh, we can see this in the design of the human embryo at the top left hand side here. Uh, we can see this in the octopus. We can see this in shells, in different plants. And uh, even here, this is a, the close up of a cone. And of course, this big sketch that we have here is the close up of a sunflower, which is absolutely perfectly proportioned to the golden means proportion, which is the spiral. And as we come to the top right hand side here, we see our DNA, which is based on two um, spirals, which is known as the double helix, uh, if, we, if we study a DNA. So we can see that the, the concept of this a spiral uh, in terms of time is not only borne out in, in, in the principle of circumcision, uh, the eighth day and the first day being the same day, or in terms of a, uh, understanding a time as a, um, a spiral, we see that it's actually in our DNA which is absolutely incredible. The spiral is a critical part of our DNA. The spiral is a critical part of creation. And the overlapping of eight and one within each repetitive spiral is a critical part of resurrection, immortality, and eternity. So coming back to the first eight verses of uh, Psalm 119 in Hebrew. Uh, notice again just the details here. There are eight alephs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this pattern is repeated 22 times in Psalm 119. Is it any wonder that it is the Psalm of Resurrection? So we see here that eight is an integral part of the construction of Psalm 119. Eight is repeated 22 times. To my knowledge, there's no other item that is repeated that many times in all of Scripture. So coming then to the resurrection of Jesus, on the eighth day of the old week, the first day of a new week. In Hebrew, the name for uh, the Saturday or the seventh day is Yom Shabbat. Whereas our Sunday is in Hebrew Yom Rishon, which means the first day. So reading from John 20 and at verse 1, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then later on in verse 19, we find then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. This could very well have been the psalm that Jesus sang as he was raised from the dead early that eighth day of the old week that gave birth to the first day of the new week when the cold tomb of Joseph of Arimathea became the warm womb of new life as the father and two angels probably Michael and Gabriel welcomed Jesus to immortality so just looking at Psalm 22 we know the psalm well uh, it is written for the director of music to the tune of the Doe of the Morning, and it's a psalm of David. And this is the very psalm that Jesus quotes from as he is dying. And we know that the psalm is divided into two specific sections. The first section of the psalm deals with the death of Jesus as expressed by himself through his feelings. And he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And then as we come to the end of this section of Psalm 22, we read these words in verse 22. As Jesus awakes from sleep, the sleep of death, he declares, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the assembly I will praise you. But just look what the writer to the Hebrews does with this particular quotation. 
in Hebrews 2 and verse 11. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, and here he quotes directly from Psalm 22 and verse 22, he says, I will declare your name unto my brethren. In the assembly I will sing your praises. And so under the directorship of the Holy Spirit, the writer says and adds this one word, I will sing your praises. And you remember that Jesus, as they left uh, the upper room on their way to Gethsemane, they sang a hymn and departed. So there is this notion of Jesus singing, not only in terms of worship, but more importantly, as he is raised from the dead. Now coming back to the construction of the Hebrew and the way in which the Hebrew is written, each letter in the original Hebrew alphabet has at least four levels of communication. The first one is sound. Each letter has its own individual phonetic sound. A, B, K, D. In addition, each letter of the Hebrew language is a word in itself. Thirdly, each letter is a pictograph in its original paleo form. It's an icon. It is a sign which determines what that letter means. And then finally, each letter has a numeric value. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail now. So looking at the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet. The sound for this letter is B. And in Hebrew, B means in. The word Bet means house or home. And the pictograph is the pictograph of a house or a home. And the number has a numerical value of two. And so you can see from the chart on the right hand side here, this is our Roman letter B. This is a modern Hebrew letter B, Bet. There it is over there. And this is a Paleo Hebrew letter dating back about 2,500 years BC. And you can see that it's in the shape of a tent or a tent door. And uh, basically the concept behind the word Beth or Bait in Hebrew is the concept of a tent or a home. And it's all associated with mother, family, love, security. And uh, for example, in Hebrew, we say Bethlehem. In Hebrew, that would be Bait Lechem, uh, which is the house of bread. Uh, Beth Shemesh, the house of the sun. Uh, Beth El, the house of God. And so as a prefix, wherever we find this word be or bet, uh, it is to do with um, the home or the house. You'll notice also that the numerical value is two. And to make a home, you need two. And this is true both in natural and spiritual terms. Uh, a house is not a home. Uh, you can live in a building and it has absolutely no value. But if it is shared, if it is shared with your partner, or with your wife, then it becomes a home. So the concept of two in the home. Um, and this is, by the way, is quite interesting because that's the very first letter of Genesis 1.1. Barashit bara Elohim et et aretz, which basically uh, is telling us that the very first letter of Genesis 1.1 is telling us that God wanted to dwell with us, with man. And he does this through his son, Jesus. So God desires to make his home in our hearts. And so we come to looking at uh, Psalm 119 and at verse 9. And you'll notice that each one of these sections uh, is uh, headed by one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So verse 9 reads, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. And that's where the home or the tabernacle is made. It is made in the human heart. So here we're looking at a very brief introduction to gematria, which is Hebrew numerology. In Hebrew, each letter possesses a numerical value. Gematria 
is the calculation of the numerical equivalence of letters, words or phrases, and on that basis gaining insight and interrelation of different concepts and exploring the interrelationship between words and ideas. Now I know that's uh, quite a mouthful there and you can see I've taken that straight out of Wikipedia over here but on the right hand side here we have the Hebrew alphabet and I'm going to go through the Hebrew alphabet with you just so that uh, we see the numbers in relationship to the letters uh, and this is an important part of the construct of Psalm 119. So here is Aleph is 1, Bet is 2, Gimel is 3, Dalit is 4, He is 5, Vav 6, Zion is 7, uh, Chet is 8, Tet is 9. And those are what we call the absolute numbers. So now we're coming to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 and 90. That's Yud, Chaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samach, Ein, Pei, Tzadik, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Taf. That's 100, 200, 300, 400. So the Hebrew alphabet goes from 1 to 400 and then later on these five finals were added to the Hebrew alphabet. They are called Sufit uh, letters and they take us from 500, 600, 700, 800, 900. And so basically within the alphabet itself we get the cycle again starting with 1 down to 900 and so coming back to 1 Aleph can be 1 or 1000 because it is uh, based on the cycle once again. We're not going to get too involved in the ordinal and the reduced numbers here just to know that each one of these letters has a numerical value in Psalm 119. So just looking at uh, one of the other levels, this is the iconic level. We're just looking at the icon here and uh, looking at this letter over here. It's called the Lamed. Uh, here we have it over here, Lamed, which has a numerical value of 30. Lamad, Lilmod, means learn and to learn. Jesus was at the age of 30 when he was baptized. And the whole concept here is to learn by teaching and teach by learning. This is the king letter. It's the tallest of all the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It is in the middle, or almost in the middle, of the 22 letters. And you'll notice here the word Melek. There's an L over there. Melek is the word for king. Malak, L over there. Malak is the word for angel. And so just looking at uh, the Paleo-Hebrew here, about 2500 BC, uh, it is basically the concept of a giant shepherd's crook. It's a ox goad. Normally this side would be quite pointed and that side over there would be quite soft. We've got this very awful letter over here in the Roman uh, lettering, which is the letter L. Here is the uh, modern Hebrew letter. It looks like a seven back to front with a little tail on the end. And you can see why it's the highest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And you can see the concept behind this is an ox goad and it is used for discipline, for learning, and for teaching. Numerical value of 30. So when we come to looking at Acts chapter 26 and verse 14, when the Apostle Paul is relating his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, notice what he says. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying to me in the Hebrew language, this is not Aramaic, it's not some other vague language, it is the Hebrew language saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In the authorized version it says, the pricks. And basically what we have here is one instrument that has two ways of instructing us. We can either learn through this side of the ox goad, which is the sharp point or the prick, uh, because as you were taking your oxen from one um, pasture to the other, uh, if your ox wouldn't uh, cross a ditch, you needed to enforce a little bit of pain, you'd give him the prick side. But if your oxen was walking on the end of a cliff and you needed to guide him, you'd need the soft side, this very soft part of the, the ox goad. Uh, to actually um, guide your, your, your ox back into uh, a, a safe kind of area. But notice with the Apostle Paul, he was an ox. He was a servant of Jesus Christ going the wrong way. He was going to persecute the church of God. 
and Jesus brings out the ox goad and gives him a good prick. And uh, you'll notice uh, that the result of that prick was uh, blindness for three days from that bright light uh, that he saw um, as Jesus uh, speaks to him. There are incredible lessons to be learned from every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. With all their beautiful levels, their numbers, their pictographs, their sounds, their words. Uh, they are beautiful, they are lovely. This is the language of God. It's the language of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just looking at this beautiful, beautiful psalm that we've considered, the song of all songs, it's a long psalm, it's the longest psalm. It's the psalm of all psalms, it's the song of all songs. It's the psalm of resurrection. It's the psalm of new beginnings, new life. It's the psalm that encompasses the whole word of God from the Aleph to the Taf, which is in Hebrew the first letter and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In the Greek that would be from the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It gives a deeper meaning to every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the psalm about the word made flesh, the one who delights to do his father's will. His law, His statutes, His testimonies, His way, His commands. And so we visualize in our hearts and in our minds the sound of over 100 million voices singing to the Lord God Almighty and to the Lamb. And so we close our thoughts in Revelation 5 and reading from verse 11, Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels round the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, forever and ever. Even so, come Lord Jesus.